in the creation story, dog was in question, and the uh, holy people said, what are we going to do with this animal? Should we do away with this animal? And the dog said, no, I will be forever the watchdog. My place will be at the door. When you make prayers, we always talk about the four-legged ones, and they're part of that group. And coyotes, which are part of the dog family, we call them children of the dawn. They come and they warn us. In the olden days, there weren't as many dogs. Of course, we didn't have as many people either. We came down to about 4,000 Navajos at one point. This we signed a treaty with the United States government. They are part of the culture. They are spiritual people and they need to be treated that way, you know, not to be feared and not to be pushed aside. They're a, an animal that was given to the Navajo people in time of need, and it served a purpose. A res dog is anything, a dog that could survive any type of weather, any type of disease. Those are the best dogs you can have. I live here and I raise here. My family all live here together, so I retired from uh, Penang coal mine. Then I, uh, I don't have nothing to do besides herding sheep. I remember my mom, she always had a very good sheep dog. When that uh, sheep dog, you know, gave a litter, everybody around, miles around, would you know, always tell her, if your dog uh, has a litter, make sure you let us know. I've seen this one dog, a working dog, a sheep herding dog, up around um, Black Rock Road. That He comes out into the highway, puts his own little life on the line for his sheep, his flock that he takes care of. He walks out into the road and he stops traffic. People actually stop for this dog and the whole flock of sheep that all walk across the road and the last one runs across and makes sure he goes into the right away fence and then the dog comes, goes off the road and tends to his business. And that's one dog that I really like admire. My name is uh, Joe Shirley Jr. I'm the sitting president of the Navajo Nation. By way of life, there are actually people, if you may. I don't know if uh, a foreigner will actually really understand what we mean when we say that uh, the dog are people. Uh, they're to be respected. They have a song. They have, they have a way. Uh, but otherwise, we do have a problem. At one time, uh, the Navajo people took pride in their animals and in, in their livestock and their appearance and how they looked and uh, how shiny they were how um, and what condition they were in. Uh, somewhere it seemed like we lost that, that animals are just supposed to take care of themselves, just let them out there and um, they'll be okay. Every time I drive up there, I see these dogs along the road. And my heart goes out to them. We've strayed from recognizing the existence and the purpose for a dog. The reason that there's so many dead dogs on the road is because I feel that they might have the same feeling as I do. They also don't like res dogs and they 
would go out of their way to hit it. And so many of them are so starved and thin and abused and neglected. They've never had human care, and that's not a life that we want. When I see a dog on the side of the road, I feel sorry for them. They don't deserve to die like that. They don't last that long. It's like getting a goldfish from the fair, they die. The dog has enough time to run across the road, but they, they tend to speed up and just run them down. Those ones, I, I drag those the carcasses off the road. I don't like seeing that. <laughs> Hurts me. We were going home and uh, there was a gunny sack on the, laying on the side of the road. It was all tied up. So my wife and my daughter stopped. And they were little puppies in there, females. You just wish for a good life for all of them, a safe life and a healthy life. I got up early this morning so I could, the funeral's at 10, so I could get there for it. I was coming through and I saw a really small dog on the left hand side of the road and it was coming towards the road. So I was watching it because I, I knew that if it came out in the road I would need to do something not to hit it. And so because I was watching that dog I didn't even see the one on the right hand side. Before I looked and it was right there, I hit it. Pieces were flying, of my car were flying everywhere. The dog, I don't even know if I ran over the dog. It was just all happened so fast. But um, I pulled over immediately and then saw the damage on my car and knew I just couldn't drive anywhere. I've hit probably five dogs in a short period of time. Uh, the last dog I hit caused about $2,300 damage to my vehicle. I think the insurance rates are pretty high here on the nation area because of all of the animal accidents. Even the possibility of my car being totaled from, from a dog, you know, eating a dog, and any kind of animal, it's not his fault, you know? That's just sad. You know, the signs on the road that say, watch for deer crossing, <laughs> you know, we should have watch for dog crossing. Uh, we've been out on the reservation for 20 years now, and uh, we've had to deal a lot with animals, so uh, jumping on people, getting in their cars, things like that. Uh, when we have tours here, we've had problem with the dogs jumping up on the table and stealing the meat, actually stealing the guy's steak. That happened one time, and uh, you know it's just because they're hungry and they dump them off here, and so they get food wherever they can. What seems to happen is every breeding cycle, someone will pick a new puppy, and when they like this puppy better, they'll take the big dog that they had that's not working out for them and take that dog and dump it back off. I was up on the reservation and we're approaching this small uh, community and uh, I was with the ABC film crew and there's a pack of dogs. We were met by at least 10 and it was rather embarrassing, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, we have to do something. Something has to be done. The tourists are the ones that usually come out of Burger King and bring a hamburger for the dog or, you know, dump some more food out for the animals. So when tourist season's over, then the animals are left hungry again. and It's in the worst time of the year. It's always winter. They uh, wonder what happens. They wonder who takes care of them. And I offer them the dog and say, you can take care of them if you'd like. Because what that does also is, is that it creates an understanding for these animals that are running astray here. That uh, if I just go up to a person's vehicle and they see me and, you know, they'll feed me. 
that's all they are. Just beggars, out of control, and it's going crazy. It's too many. There's too many dogs just roaming around, especially at night. You can hear them uh, turning over garbage cans. And them dogs keep you up. That's what I don't like. Um, there's just too many dogs. Uh, I, I don't even think we have a true figure as to how many animals that we do have out there. Anywhere else, an animal on the street would be chaos, would be on television, it'd be like a uh, high-speed chase that you see on television with animals on the road. Uh, here, it's not even an issue, it's not even uh, a problem to, for, for some people. The Navajo Reservation of the 70s and 80s was still primarily a rural community. And what's happened is it's kind of shifted into an urban community kind of like the 50s in the in United States wide because people all lived on a ranch and farm before that now they all live in these little cluster villages that have been put up and before that you know everybody had three or four or five dogs at home wasn't that big of an issue or a problem they used them for livestock never used now they all still have three or four or five dogs you know they live 120 feet apart from each other the places where you have to worry about the most, I think, are like where the like the Navajo Housing Authority places because they really don't have fences and people love to keep mean dogs. They love to raise their dogs mean. We don't care about our neighbors anymore and we don't want anybody to come see us because now we've got vicious dogs around our home to keep people away. Uh, rather than bringing a community together, we take a community apart. The next morning, I guess, when my parents got back, they, they were the ones who saw the blood, and we didn't see hear anything, and came downstairs, and there was a big old mess. And her dog was attacked by a Rottweiler, and you can see that um, the bite wound, wounds around the throat. This Rottweiler grabbed a hold of this little dog and shook it. Oh, yeah, we have vicious dogs that are prohibited pit bulls, Rottweilers, blue healers, chows. People tend to treat them or train them to be vicious and very protectful of, of their property. You know, once a dog gets a taste of blood, you know, he's most likely to attack again. Okay, my job and assignment was I was supposed to design and do a profile by surveying. But in the course of doing it, while I walked up to that fence, one of the pit bulls jumped over and the fight ensued right here at the corner, right in here. Till finally the owner came out and retrieved his animal. The dog was just covered with blood. And I was in such pain, I ran and staggered. I guess an EMT or a firefighter had come running across. It gives me the willies, to be honest. I'm sort of, uh, I don't know exactly what to say. It's just traumatic. I kind of feel, um, I guess, reliving the attack over and over again, uh, just to even be here. And I drive by this place all the time, it always brings back memories, you know, it's not very good. We were at my grandma's friend's house and we were, um, we were walking out and then that that dog was a mean dog and I was scared and then I was trying to run out and then I guess it, it knew that I was scared of it so it grabbed me by the leg. They will run after the kids and uh, bark at them or even in some cases they'll bite them. In some area she was out I guess taking a walk out in the front of her house or something her and her dog and these pit bulls jumped on her dog and then they turned on the lady and jumped on the lady and chewed her up pretty bad. Uh, she died later on in the hospital. A year ago, we took statistics and there was about 3,000 people that come in each year for medical treatment for dog bites. We're doing everything we can, of course, at the, at the moment to address the dog problem. Our dogs are just out of control. The dog population is just out of control. It was really bad. I came home and my husband went down to the corral to feed the horses. He came back up and said, all the sheep are dead. A lot of people on the outside don't understand what the livestock mean to Navajo people. 
out here, it's very much intertwined with who we are. Right now, there's two incidents, two separate places. This one, and there's one down below. This season is very critical as far as um, livestock damage in relation to dogs attacking sheep and cattle and foals. Uh, we've had documentation of where over 80 head of livestock were killed in one night by dogs. So in one night, a family's subsistence living off of livestock could be destroyed overnight. There's dogs all over the place that attack livestock. So it's pretty getting worse and worse every day. I think if we don't um, take measures, it's going to become very, I mean, it's going to become worse. When all of a sudden people start waking up, um, the lady that was found eaten up in Shipra started things happening. I get sometimes get it pretty emotional when actually elderly people losing all their flock of sheep or something happens like this. Our situations become very critical. You have to have a tragedy before anything's done about it. Lawsuits gotta be filed before people um, realize that this is an issue, that this is a problem. Because if you take a look at the, uh, the size of the Navajo Nation, which is 25,000 square miles, and 17 million acres and a territory about the size of West Virginia and and you have uh, six individuals patrolling it, it, it's 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 on balance and these all get killed by dogs no doubt about it dogs when I, I did it there were seven families that had been hit and five had lost their entire flock and by the time that I finished talking with the animal control officer and updating it, it was like 15 families. Yeah, their whole flock is gone. Just because of dogs. And so what we have is we have extreme situations that we have to deal with, so it takes extreme measures to handle them. When we first started this thing, it was like a bunch of dogs up there, so we're like kind of out, outnumbered up there. So we so started naming it the Hamburger Hill. It's like that, yeah, that movie. Is it just a back? Spider. 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 Ten four copy, nineteen. I don't want to knock the Navajo Nation at all. I really think the only reason a lot of the animal control issues are problems out here, the reason everything has been happening is they just don't have the budget. We're an evolving nation. Um, certainly, I don't know how they've calculated, like I say, is that they tell me that we're 31 years behind the times, Navajo people. Uh, behind the mainstream. I don't know how much of a adult problem the mainstream has. Um, we need to look at that and, and if they don't have a adult problem, how is it that they're addressing? Uh, what is it that they're doing that, that, that's keeping it under control? I guess they have deemed that uh, animal control isn't near as important as some of the other issues. You know, when you have a house with uh, six or seven people living in it, and it's only one or two rooms, nobody has any food, That's, that issue is a lot more important than a dog. When we do our orientation with our families, we allow them to bring in two pets. You know, part of the agreement is that they would have to be leached, but sometimes, you know, they'll have it tied up for one day and the next, you know, it's out on the street. 
The thing about, uh, I think, Navajos is we don't want to be fenced in. I think that might be a cultural thing, but I think we need to uh, take a real serious look at what it means to own a dog and not have a fence. But we're doing everything we can now to advocate, you know, fencing of uh, yards and, and clustered uh, dwellings, you know, uh, villages. We do have um, a dog sweep that we do with the animal control officers. Um, we make arrangements and we can get them to schedule us in, you know, to do the dog sweep with us. Where's your dog stick? What we're going to do today is what we usually conduct uh, animal sweep. It's which we go in and check all the strays and loose dogs and see if they're vaccinated and licensed. Yeah, $50 fines and minimum fine for having a dog loose. On top of that, they get cited for not having their dog license. It's another $50 fine and no license. It's another fee. So they, they look at $150 every time. These are for like um, trapping the animals, the, like the dogs. You send them out like behind houses or whoever requests for them. We go out there and set these up for them. And um, that's how we catch our strays. Animal control fees are higher than speeding tickets. You know, speeding tickets, seat belt violation, they're only 30, $37.50 or something like that. Yeah, usually we always end up catching what we what they request for. Um, it's a lot, I'd say it's a lot safer than out running after them because um, sometimes they'll the animals will get mad and turn around and charge at you. I haven't been scratched by cats and stuff. Dog charges, we, we will have one of the catch poles and um, try to catch it around the neck. Also bitten on the legs, probably both sides and also on the arm here. If they ask us, if you guys take it from me now, and if I claim it back in tomorrow or this afternoon, how much am I going to pay to get it back? To, will they ask us that? Yeah, the first day will be 35. Okay. Every day till Thursday, 3 o'clock. That's their deadline to get their animals back. Then after that, everything else will be euthanized. The thing here is to have fun and just get out there and just watch your back because sometimes these dogs will try to snap at you out of you know, fear when they try to take off and stuff. So, so we just everybody just watch yourselves and you know, let's have some fun, make some friends.
You you just take them because um because they're not tied up. Yeah, they have to be tied up all the time. They have to have their shots too. Yeah, especially their shots that way they won't get sick or anything. So little kids like you guys won't, won't get, get bit, bit and get sick from them. Especially up that's especially why we don't want you guys no more kids getting bit. There's too many kids getting bit now and we're trying to prevent that. Yeah, there's a cat back there in the back, way in the back that's dangerous. That's the reason why it's going too. Don't want to happen again. No more bites. Okay? Okay. Yeah, it'll be okay. They can pick it up. It's going to be okay. We're just going to be fed, watered. It's going to be in, um, in uh, its own place with have, all the other puppies. We have you. We have a dog too. Really? Yeah. Just keep it tied up then. And make sure you take it to the doctor, the, the pet animal doctor, the vet, so they can take care of it. Give it a shot to them. Ready? We're trying to train our tenants that these things are all avoidable. You can tell basically how the family is if they're abusing their dogs, their pets, you know, most likely majority of the time there is abuse in the home. You know, we're kind of losing some of our ways, you know, some of our knowledge regarding not only dogs, but knowledge about other areas of, of life out there. I think a lot of it has to do with that. Uh, and then getting practical, I think a lot of it also because um, of the lack of uh, resources. We, we have very limited resources to address uh, the dog problem. Right now, all of our services are from the outside. Uh, we do get the services, but after 13 years of service, we still have overpopulation problems. So changing the behaviors is where we need to be. We've been operating in First Nations in North America since 1994. It was our first time to come to the Navajo Nation. It was actually in partnership with the Humane Society of the United States and the Pegasus Foundation. The Bay Neuter Assistance Program called SNAP, they do go out for grant funding and they do get funding to support the truck on the nation. So we hope to have a full schedule this year. That's hard, yeah, I see. It goes around the body. So this is where we go to get the shot. Is that good? So we got his shot. Now does he need to come back for more shots or? He needs to come back in three weeks. To in get three weeks? Injection and three weeks after that. What um, program I've worked with is Black Hat, and what they're doing is mostly doing it through foster uh, care. And I don't think that we can get out there with with our program or the tribes program or or any of the other little affiliates that have came in and spay and neuter them fast enough. And I do think that that's a viable, um, good program that needs to be done. But ultimately what has to happen is that the people have to have a different mindset. This is the Black Hat t-shirt. It shows that we take care of all animals, not just dogs. We've rescued, um, last year we rescued 218 dogs, 42 cats, three sheep and two horses. We are talking about animal control and how we have been wanting to work with them, but sometimes it's hard. They have different agendas, but we're both basically working to to help the animals, and I think that's where we, we need to come together. Right now, it is a threat where it's going to spread out to these other animals around here. So, best thing I can tell you to do is get rid of it. It's, it's beyond getting treated. I mean, this is really bad. You see, I don't know what if I should just let you guys take him out because my mom was so mad at me. See, what hair it's, it has left, it's going to be all gone. And they start stinking too. And what's going to happen is we're just going to refer this to um, environmental health, and most likely they're going to come out and look at this and do an evaluation, do a report on that. And from there, most likely it's going to go to NHA and it's obviously manged out. Yeah, there, are, there are some that are worse oh, that sorry. I've seen, but this is just the beginning of it where it's going to get worse. Especially on the hot days, yeah, it does bother them because they start itching. 
and pretty much the whole area that's right where the dog is laying, the dog house, everything needs to be destroyed. They, they can't keep that. My name is Paula Johns. I am the Director of Operations for the Northern Arizona Second Chance Center for Animals, which is also responsible for Plateauland Mobile Veterinary Clinic. Last year, I believe it was two years ago, we did about 51 surgeries in one day. We really want to do as many as we can and just get them done. And also, at the same time, um, do preventive medicine like the vaccinations because we can prevent distemper and parvo and that's those are the two main diseases that are very common on the reservation. A lot of organizations out there uh, are bordered to the Navajo Nation that will actually use Navajo Nation statistics so they may write grants and get proposals as well. I had started off working with uh, Mike Kalana, Brenda Roundhorse and Glenda Davis trying to find out facts and information I worked with the OEH office and um, the clinic here in town trying to find out how many bite wounds there were in town, how many vicious attacks there were, and there, there has actually been some pretty brutal attacks, some including up to five dogs. Bottom line is that they have to comply with our procedures on how to start a business as an animal control service or setting up a shelter for animal control but uh, the bottom line is that you need to go through our tribal legislators. The animal control portion of the Navajo tribe, um, it's challenging. Um, they have um, different attitudes than we do, um, and they look at things differently. We've got three of them over here, too. Here we come. He's going that way. He's going that way. There you go. Okay. Come on. Come on, boy. Yay! One of the things that um, I heard was that the dogs were handled somewhat roughly by the animal control people. It's a way to distance yourself from the animal. I mean, who wants to like an animal you know you're going to have to kill within, you know, a couple, three days? We've heard by teleconference or different discussions, you know, the law is this and you can't do this type of thing, you know, so, but the Navajo Nation laws are old. Some of those laws need to change. Very few of these organizations are actually helping the Navajo Nation. The way I see it is most of them are coming in and wanting to help us but it seems like we're being used all the time. That title is just being thrown around and it's not you know, being respected in any way. I guess we don't trust these organizations is what it comes down to. And we are always very respectful of cultures and beliefs that are different than our own. And so we don't ever want to be perceived as outsiders coming in and trying to force an idea on a culture that um, is not recognized by that culture, but I believe when we create partnerships that last as long as 12 and 13 years that we do have the right to challenge beliefs and to present new ideas that may be against current cultural practice. And I feel it's an appropriate role for an animal protection organization considering that animals are still being rounded up and shot, um, you know, right after we go through and, and, and have a spay neuter operations. So we're not really wanting to to do away with dogs uh, or to get at killing dogs per se, you know, to, to bring down the populace. Uh, because there are people. Uh, they're to be respected. They have a song. They have, they have a way. Uh, but otherwise we do have a problem. 
You got three days to get rid of all these dogs okay. to your relatives. Three days. Since when do you guys care about these dogs running around here? It's been going on for how many years now? They're the ones who request the NHA. We're doing it with them. Okay? I'm sorry, but can we keep her? Can we keep her? Yes, we have papers on her. Yes, I can run inside and get them. The shuttle is still at the end thing he's shot yet. You miss him. You might as well go back and pick him up too. There's another small one, another flat one. The first house, because there's two right there. It'll be 35 to get back out. 35 to out. $10 an hour mission animal license. After 12 o'clock, we're going to add on $5 for the boarding. You came into a problem? We're trying to figure out what we can do with these dogs now since their cages are full. And this is just the beginning of the housing here. So we don't want to, especially mine, I don't want to pack any more dogs in there. We, we can probably put in about maybe three or four more in this one that's about it. But there are a lot of strays here that need to be picked up. And we can't just leave them out there too. Hey, is your mom or somebody home? Yeah. Oh, there. Grandma. You there? Good. The Connets man up there. The Connie in the place. Anthony with the Twisty Animal Control. Uh -huh. And what we're doing here is working with NXA. We're picking up strays and checking on dogs that aren't that are not uh, yeah, restrained. Go ahead and take a. Well, there's. I don't know about these. Yeah. I didn't mind dogs. I don't know. Let's see, I don't live here. And well, we've seen these guys put a couple of dogs in there in the horse trailers. So that's ones I'm uh, asking about on those ones. Do you have any shot records on them? That white one, that white one, and that brown one got spaded just not too long ago, about a week ago. Yeah, we were looking at that one. That one was running around loose up front. Yeah. Now we need to care right now. Otherwise, unless one of you guys want to take responsibility for it, we can issue citations. Go ahead, guess. Just take it. Cause we don't, we don't have nothing else in our dogs. So. Okay. That's the signal. Go in. Let's go. That week, gosh, I think it was like about over, um, close to 100, close to 100 that they brought in. To a point where I had to euthanize them right then and there because I have no room for all these unwanted dogs. <laughs> it's challenging working out here with my tribe and I try to help my um, nation as much as I can every day, you know. The tribe um, would give us so much um, supply money, I, I believe it was like $6,000. And six, out of that $6,000, you break it up to these five shelters that we have through the Nalfa Nation, so that really boils down to like $300 worth of supplies mm. per year. So that's when I run out of dog food, cat foods, I contact the grocery store, IGA, Bashes, you know. Do you guys have any other dog foods that has been torn, you know, can you donate it to us, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're trying to do everything we could every day. We try to look for other organizations such as Arizona Humane Society, um, several organizations in New Mexico and Albuquerque, see if they could come out and adopt several of these dogs they tell us that they're either full and they can't do it or they can't find any foster homes and it just kind of, it just seems like we just you know are stuck in a rut we can't we can't get out of that rut we try but there's you know there's really nothing we can do but to put these animals to sleep it gets really stressful when you put down a hundred dogs a month or you know sometimes even within the week 
and it, it's very stressful on, on all of us. As a matter of fact, when we open our shelter in October, the Second Chance Shelter will be working closely with the nation, bringing animals um, that would otherwise be euthanized, and um, they have agreed to that, and I think it's a huge first step in um, stopping the needless massive euthanasia. At some point we're not making any headway. We come back and we hear about the roundups and we hear about um, you know, the, the problems with animal control and we hear about the strays on the street and, and so we wonder and our funders ask us at some point are we throwing good money after bad. If the Navajo Nation would follow some of their own laws such as sterilizing animals before they adopt because that is Navajo Nation law and if they could be more proactive in enacting some more some humane ordinances doing away with these roundups if we can look at these roundups and realize this is not the way to do it besides being inhumane it's not solving the problem they don't get rid of it in the sense I, I mean I hate to say get rid of but that's exactly what they're thinking they don't take it to a shelter they don't have it euthanized they let it run, they turn it loose, they drop it off at a school, they drop it off at a, or it dies on the side of the road, or they take it in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I would rather have it put to sleep than to have it suffer what it will suffer. So they end up just loading up the whole litter and just dumping them off at a, anywhere that anywhere possible where they can maybe find homes that they can run away to or people can take them in. But some probably don't even survive. They probably get malnutrition and die or you know, other animals probably get, get at them and kill them. Pet animals, dogs and cats, are dependent animals. They cannot exist as wildlife. To just let them be out there trying to live off the land is, is, is not right. It's just I don't know how to say it without offending some people, but you have to take responsibility for what you've done to your own community. Frank is really a, a welcome breath of fresh air for our programs, and we're really excited to have somebody who's um, challenging um, traditional beliefs and culture and, and thinking differently about um, animal homelessness on the Navajo Nation. The way we're doing it right now, we're really just spinning our wheels. I, I feel like sometimes we come into a community and we put a little band-aid on a situation that falls off as we drop as we drive out of town. I set up an appointment and I brought my pets here, my you know my cat and my dog, and my male cat was going to get neutered also and get his shots. But my cat went inside the mobile van and he freaked out. There's a girl. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, shit. She's out. It happened as while you guys were injecting them or something? Or? No, the cat got loose and was running around in the clinic. Inside in there? Yeah. It's okay. She was just scared. I know she didn't mean it. I feel really, really bad for what happened to such nice, wonderful people, you know, that are here to help us. But I guess they just went ahead and went through with doing the vaccinations and everything else. Right now it's inside, you just getting uh, spayed or probably neutered, it's a male. So and that's what we came here for. I, I feel really, you know, really grateful for the person who set up this whole program. I think it's just a matter of education. Although we have the, the, the freebies for spay and, and neutering, uh, there's not the, the people coming forward in mass, so to speak, to, to get their dogs and, and, and you know spayed or neutered. We all need to be active in preventing this problem. I mean, we're too complacent with you know animals being dead on the road. It's a terrible sight. It's you know, so you see that every day. Why should it be something so common that it's, you know, just a dead dog on the road? That should not be the mentality. We give them all this education, tell them here's what you should do, here's what you should do. There's nowhere for them to go. I mean, there's got to be, um, these guys' the shelters over ran, our foster homes are overran, um, other people's foster homes are overran. You know, we can have a few mobile spay neuter clinics out there but we need more.
We need more. I really think that there's a difference in trust, whether it's the person trusting me because I'm Navajo versus like say another organization coming in and telling the people what to do with their animals. I really think that there is a difference. We would like to see our own shelters. We would like to see more animal control officers. We would like to see communities that are actively helping to reduce animal population. The tribe can just give us so much mileage per month, I believe it was two or three thousand. Once we get over our mileage, we just have to park our unit and just stay here to shelter. They have to travel a long distance in different communities, you know, where um, they need to have a budget for their lodging, their travel expense, and you know, as far as their vehicle uh, mileage of wear and tear, you know, I know also that um, they're being paid pretty much at a, a minimum wage labor pay. Can I have an also over at the Holiday There's a stray dog right over there. Why don't you pick that one up too? He's got their shots. They've got collars with phone numbers on them, and they are mine. Okay, like they said, the dogs were at least half the time. They were under my car. The little girl okay. saw you strangling it. She said, we try to get it that's back. Right. I have crying. a dog owner here that's being irate with me. I'm not being irate. I just want my puppies back. What's going to happen, though, is she's going to be cited with you. a lot of insults and stuff like that from dog owners, but we have to do it. Uh, it I know it's a tough job, but we got to do it. Uh, we come across people like this pretty much. So hopefully this afternoon when we finish up this stuff, it's, it doesn't get as bad as this. It, it, it does get worse sometimes. We do get assaulted sometimes. I'm going to keep them tied up. She didn't want to give them up for adoption. She wanted to keep them. I'm just glad that we're getting our puppies back. Let's go enjoy your lunch. I don't feel like eating now. <laughs> well, thanks. Oh. In the two years that I've been here, all I've been told is budget's been cut again, the budget's been cut again. I know there are some vacancies, and I don't know, you know as far as them being filled, what's going on. Um, but I think there are a few available positions, but even then, it's just, it's just dismal. They cut that whole thing up so it was wide open. Oh. Stole my chain again, so it was like, I mean, I gave up repairing it, you know. And then we don't have the supply money to repair, to put up a brand new, um, uh, chain link fence again. And this is all the food that we have left for the end of the year. I wish I could say that I've seen more change. I think maybe the two years that I've been with SNAP is not very long. And I think the change that needs to happen is going to take a lot longer. We should be working together in communities. We should be addressing overpopulation. There should not be an unowned dog. Each dog should, you know, have its place in its home, you know, whether it's a protector, a guardian, whether it's a companion or friend, or whether it's, you know, a working animal in, in a herd. All those animals in their use should be taken care of. I spay them and neuter them and give them out to good homes and I don't ask people for money for them. That's as long as they take care of him. And if they can't take care of him, I ask them to bring him back and I'll find somebody somewhere else to take him. You know, we need to come together as, as a team, but it also needs to come from the Navajo Nation out. If we're not taking care of our animals, we really can't take care of anything else. You gotta love animals. <laughs> animals are good to have, I guess, for stress relieving and just being around and having a companion. All of us needs each of us, and each of us needs all of us to make this happen. Like this guy will probably be around for a long time, unless he goes into the road and gets hit. <laughs> Other than that, he'll be with us for a while. You need to have someone willing to go out and be 
ready to educate and, and explain things to people and stuff. You know, it's it's nice if you come in, but you also have to have a good foundation in the community to get anything done. Tonight's event is the first of its kind, hopefully the first annual Rescue the Res Dogs benefit. And the funds raised tonight through ticket sales and the silent auction will help to keep us on the road on the Navajo Nation, spaying and neutering. It is my great honor and certainly privilege to introduce the president of the Navajo Nation, uh, Mr. Joe Shirley. On behalf of the people, it comes from the heart when I say it, thank you very much for having been there for us all these years. I think back on Navajo, this is the 13th year we're into the spay, uh, spay and neutering uh, assistance program. Uh, there was a lot of money expended uh, all in the course of that time. A lot of personnel come forward to, to do the surgery. A lot of doctors, I believe 10 organizations, participated you know, all these years to, to help us, as well as uh, the world beyond Navajo land. And so, as our relatives, as our friends, you've been there for us, and I want to say thank you. And of course, we continue to need help. The powers that be that are out there, uh, the relatives that have the means to help, I, we continue to, to ask for that help. Prayerfully, hopefully, uh, that help will continue to be there, you know, for to, to address the challenges that's facing us as a people, you know, with our dogs and with our cats and, and with, our, with our animals. given the program the authority to enforce the laws. We wanted to educate people first, and if that didn't work, then the enforcement action would uh, run its course. We realized that if we could help people become responsible in their community, starting right at home, being responsible at home, taking care of animals, and start caring about animals, that it would have a dramatic effect on the whole household.
Are you guys going to take our dog? Or no?